Thank you so much, Ricardo. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Baker Institute. Uh, thank you, all the panelists um, at this panel. I just wanted to ask one thing, if you allow me. Since we're late, uh, what is the last, um, I mean, time, time. I want to know exactly when we have to end. Eleven forty is now. Now it's eleven forty. So, if we can end by uh, twelve thirty, and then Tony's gonna give us a goodbye message. Well, thank you so much. Thank you so much. Thank you for being here, and I uh, thank you so much. Uh, and it's great to have this last panel where we're going to be discussing about the specific uh, political parties. We're going to talk about what they represent, their coalitions, and also a little bit about the cleavages, but more focused on each one of the political parties that exist in Mexico. So, I, like we wanted to do, let's propose we do, the presenters will not talk about their own papers or their own um, essays. They're very important because every one of them is talking about one political party in the context of these elections uh, that we're going to have in June. And also the elections are going to be held in 2024. So I thank you very much to all the speakers. I'm going to ask these questions um, in a general way. And if you can tell me, uh, maybe uh, every single one of you wrote one of the chapters about each party in particular. But the questions that I have prepared Perhaps all of us could uh, give answers to the question so that we can save some time. So I would ask the speakers then to please, first of all, introduce yourselves when you do your first introduction so that we can move the process along because we have very little time left. And if you can raise your hand and then I'm going to let you speak. And if you can sort of be brief in your answer or when the answer has to do with your own area of expertise and your chapter, of course, you let us know. So all these questions, as you know, are addressed to one person, but obviously in this context, uh, we can all participate. We can all um, give an answer. The first question uh, focuses more on the article I was honored to write with one of the most significant, hardworking uh, Mexican political analysts, very well known in the country. I asked uh, Ricardo Rafael if he could uh, help me write this article on Morena. So the first question uh, focuses more on this party because right now it's the most important political force in Mexico. It's the force represented uh, by the uh, president of the republic uh we talked about the number of resources allocated to this party for many reasons so morena what is morena obviously this uh a question more for you um in the discussion uh of this book but also the other prisoners so what is morena and where is it going after this electoral process uh, we're waiting for the results, but where does it go from here, from the midterm elections and the election of 2024? So what is Morena? Is it a party? Is it a movement? Thank you very much, Ricardo, for being here. Ricardo, if you want to introduce yourself and talk a little bit about our work. Thank you. Thank you very much, Guadalupe. It's really an honor for me to have uh, shared all of these uh, reflections with you. Uh, we both tried to respond to this question, to answer this question using uh, this uh, theoretical uh, uh, academic framework, but um, I'll take the liberty of sharing this with uh, those who are here today, uh, where uh, it's a very uh, complicated starting point because even though we have a kind of a new political phenomenon in Mexico, um, in order to understand this phenomenon, people uh, who uh, work on uh, prior theories, uh, those are not very useful nowadays. I see many uh, of my colleagues in academia that are really confused, but they're really uh, using this older political theories. And 
we um, interviewed a, a significant number of people who were involved in the founding of Morena. And not all of them had the same answer, but I think we have firsthand information. We also then reviewed the literature about um, the Morena case, and it's really worthwhile uh, mentioning because uh, this seminar has really given a lot of answers to what uh, the issues that you've exposed, but uh, this very little literature about Morena. And there's a lot of class prejudice too. There's a lot of anger because of the lack of understanding. So there's uh, very few explanations or, or ways to answer your question. So first thing I will say is that given the importance of this political phenomenon, what it means for Mexico, we uh, really encourage to like encourage people to do a, a deeper analysis, a deeper study of this political phenomenon. Now, this is a term that we use in Spain at one point, but I'm gonna use it now. This is a hurricane, a tornado that came into the party's regimen and transformed it in uh, 2015 or until 2015 maybe. Uh, it was a very predictable system. Three parties would get 80% of the votes. When Morena arrived in 2015, and at that time, yeah, it only reached 8.3%, yes, but in 2015, those three parties dropped from concentrating 80% they only got 60% of the vote. And in the 2018 elections, those three parties slid down to under 40% of the votes. And honestly, I mean, everyone has their data, but if I review, for example, a, the poll published by Buendia, Marx Universal, the published by one published by El Financiero, El País, the most recent ones, uh, PRI and PAN, each one separately, don't go beyond 17% of the preferences of the elector, electorate. So they're gonna stay there. So this election is not going to transform that. And we see Morena going in the other direction, it's growing. So faced with this, and there are some basic questions and I hope this uh, panel can respond. So just one suggestion. Be careful not to uh, go to simple answers. This is a political phenomenon that uh, is simple. This, I would think, started going back to the elections in Tabasco in 1990, and we could even see it growing until the 2006 elections. But in 2009, there was a very serious crisis of this movement, the Lopez Obrador movement. At that time, he had lost all control of the PRD. He uh, only uh, focused on Ixtapalapa. Ixtapalapa. He played all his cards in order to keep Ixtapalapa. And after that experience, the Lopez Obrador movement is reshaped into this social movement. It's a social movement with a, a covers of territory that responds to the parameters that you were mentioning a minute, a minute ago. It's uh, a fine reading of uh, the this politics. And it's a party that is a, a left-leaning party, but it's not a socialist party is anti-liberal, but at the same time, he respects some of the principles of the Washington consensus. It's a party that is essentially Christian, Catholic, evangelical. So that's a good part of its base. And in fact, it is a party that started from Querétaro, moving south in 2015, started concentrating the votes there. But in 2018, after, the alliance started uh, 
entering the, the uh, sections one and two, and it's a party that started to have influence, and after 2012, it started attracting the younger generations. That set of elements, those cleavages, with a very impressive territorial base, because, you know, they uh, promote a voter registration and they cover territory based on districts, not municipalities, not states, not the country. And it's in something that's enviable to any other party. <clears throat> so what they told us, what the people we interviewed said is that territorial organization is the one that gave it all its strength. So what's going to happen next Monday? Has it lost strength in people who didn't have it before? So one and two, has it lost some strength amongst the young people? Yeah, I think so. It's been a significant blow there. But if it look at data, the slide, the drop between 18 and 21 is small. And the hurricane keeps blowing there. And with an individual who has a talent for a populist discourse, you know, let's be careful. So if we interpret this with that uh, uh, class uh, bias that we tend, we academics tend to have, that uh, doesn't allow us to analyze this phenomenon. So I'm trying to summarize my response, but I think we are beginning to study a phenomenon that's much more complex that we're willing to accept. Thank you very much, Ricardo. I think uh, there's a lot to discuss there. It's great that you uh, summarize it that way so we can uh, let our colleagues now talk about their own work, their area specialty, uh, specialization, and we are uh, trying to place everything we wrote in the 2021 electoral process and what's uh, what does the future look like depending on the results of the election. So again, thank you very much. It's been a privilege to work with you because of all your experience and this access that we had, thanks to you, to the founders of the party and the people who have been closest to the uh, building of the party and this moment we're living through. So. Thank you, Guadalupe. It was my privilege. No, no, it's mine. And I hope to continue working with you on this issue. Thank you very much. And very uh, briefly also, if somebody wants to talk about Morena, I want to introduce my colleagues at this uh, round table, this panel. We have uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Dainzu Lopez de Lara, from Puebla, Dr. Reynoso, also uh, international relations professor at the University of the Americas, also with uh, um, I think he's a very talented young man. Thank you very much for introducing him to me. I'm sure he will have a lot to say uh, about the uh, Mexican parties in the U.S. We also have uh, Professor uh, Rodriguez Alonso from the Autonomous University of Ciudad Juarez. And we have Rene Torres Ruiz, who's going to talk about the PRD. I don't know, Rene, if you uh, have anything to say about Moreno, we will continue with the questions. Please, you're going to talk about the PRD, PRD. So I, I imagine you would like to take a jab at that question. What is Morena, a party, a movement? What's the status of the party right now? Thank you, Guadalupe. It's a pleasure to be here with all of you. I'm very thankful to the organizers of the event, of course, and thanks for the invitation to be here today. Uh, I would say that I'm almost totally in agreement with what Ricardo Rafael said about Morena. I have the impression that when we talk so much about obradorism uh, when we talk as when we talk about Morena, we are talking about 
in a destructive fashion very often from the uh, academic environment. I have the impression that there is a lot of uh, grievance, a lot of resentment perhaps, and maybe a uh, inability on the part of the opposition, both political parties or academic intellectual circles of maybe uh, overcoming or maybe forgiving uh, 2018. I think that creates a distorted view. And like Ricardo Rafael is, was saying, we're still at the beginning of studying and trying to understand what Obradorism means, what Morena is. I agree that Morena is a political party that's uh, uh, in, in getting form. It's a party that's building an identity. And that building process is very difficult and complex because inside Morena, there are different groups of uh, with very uh, different uh, characteristics. Of course, there are religious groups that we should maybe have, could identify as a conservative, but there are also groups that come from the uh, social left, the, the left of the 70s and 80, the ones who created the Mexican Socialist Party or the PRD, the Democratic Revolution, and, you know, the Constitution 1988. So Morena is a conglomerate of different political factions. Some of them identify clearly with the, the left, a social, progressive, combative, critical left, critical of the authoritarianism that has characterized uh, the Mexican political regimes for many decades. So to me, Morena, again, it's a party information and I would also say it's a party that's in motion. It's a party, uh, party as Angelo Palebianco would say, it has a structure that allows it to compete in elections as a professional party. It wins elections and it behaves as a party, but it also it has a wide social base that, uh, accompanies uh, many uh, uh, movements. Uh, the most visible one is Lopez Obrador. But uh, to that extent, I think it's a party in motion that uh, focuses on winning elections like uh, they will do uh, on the six and they will be successful, uh, surely. It also has a, a wide significant social base that allows for that mobilization uh, for it allows them to have a presence in the public square and that requires or demands solutions get organized uh, to face certain challenges. And this makes it uh, even more complex. It makes even more complex the, the task of consolidating against a political party. Thank you, Rene. I think it's very important to talk about Morena but it's also important to talk about the other parties in this very uh, uh, specific context. So we'd like to see what the other panelists say uh, as far as the coalition Seaport of Mexico and the parties that uh, comprise it in the framework of these elections. What are the challenges what is the role of the coalition? What's the role of other actors like the uh, corporate sector, uh, all of those uh, that are part of the uh, 4T? I would like to know, you know, what's what's the future? Why was this coalition formed? What are the most, who are the most important actors of this coalition? What's the future of the parties themselves? Because obviously after the uh, 2018 process, the, what used to be the main political parties ended up in a completely different situation. So I would like to know what do you think in, about the coalition name C por Mexico? Yes, for Mexico. So who would like to take a jab of that? Daisu. Okay, hello, Lola. Thank you, good afternoon. Thank you for the invitation to this uh, seminar. And this 
coalition, I mean, Mauricio Merino, Dr. Aloesa have already talked about the coalition and pretty much the aberration that it, it represents. The coalition among these three parties who forge the three parties that we've known since 1989 and who have given rise to electoral reforms to expand this political plurality and it consolidated in 97 when uh, PRI lost its majority. And curiously, Lopez Obrador was uh, part of the system as a leader of the PRD. The uh, idea was to join this political negotiation. And I agree with Merino that the coalition uh, takes away from that political identity. And it, it only shows uh, political pragmatism. It's just gaining uh, positions. Now, for the PRI, this was a very costly proposition in 2012 when they uh, presented a person with questionable uh, moral and professional qualities. And in 2018, Moreno, uh, Moreno wasn't against that PRI administration, which was totally political. So PRI even debilitated, uh, but as the only country with a national presence, uh, pretty much the only one, but uh, also evolving in the electoral structure, as, as we were saying, and a lot of the political, the, the support, the territorial support migrated from PRI to Morena. And uh, even being a mass, the party of the masses has been able to conquer that new militancy. And obviously, then they have committed strategic errors, like for example, the lack of political humility to recognize the errors made when they were in the government. And they were unable also to build a new political alternative to uh, take a position and to act in consequence. So uh, a lot of people from pre uh, saying that Lopez Obrador is going back to the past, but again, they uh, keep, uh, they're not looking at what they did in the rear view mirror. And we, as a reflection of the plural lists, they were not open as uh, Juan Pablo Calero calls it, the uh, Eurocracia, the patronage, etc. Uh, and in the end of the day, Marco Cortez, all of them, they have uh, an image and the PRD, again, is in, you know, it's, uh, political existence is at risk. They don't reach 3%. So uh, the coalition has benefited, but only in terms of its political survival. And uh, okay, if you, since we don't have much time, if you can also comment not only about the coalition, but what will be the role of the small parties? Ricardo wanted to talk a little bit about the coalition, but again, taking into account this role, what will be the role of the small parties? Obviously it's not the same uh, subject, but again, any comments about this are welcome because I would like for all of you to talk. So again, Victor and then Ricardo, whatever you want to say about the coalition and the future of small parties in the context of the elections of this year and 2024. Yes, thank you. A very interesting topics. Uh, greetings, everybody. I'm very happy to see everybody. I would uh, prefer to have this in person, but we can't do it. Uh, as far as the uh, small parties, most of them, they don't have a link, a connection with society. Those are interest groups that don't see or, or don't listen to the citizens. Uh, briefly about Morena, I agree that we have to make an effort to see things as they are. I remember that uh, story of the uh, group of blind people and the elephant is a very uh, powerful metaphor. In Puebla, I'm analyzing 
the case of Puebla. How do I see Morena? I see Manuel Barquez, our governor. I know him well. Velasco, he was with the PRI until 2017, very close to Mario Marin. I see Alejandro Armenta, he was with PRI until 2017. I see the news about the election in Puebla. Basically, those uh, internal disputes within Morena. They just uh, took down the state leader, the governor who was uh, fighting the candidate to the uh, mayoral position. Uh, I know I'm, I'm only seeing part of the elephant, but it is a part of the elephant. And the coalition, I think the cleavage is very clear. Mauricio Merino talked very clear about that, even though he doesn't agree with the coalition, but he presented very clearly about the uh, fracture lines, the, the, the idea of the cleavage and what it is at this time in the country. There's an attempt to concentrate power in two hands. There's an attempt to destroy all the institutional framework that has been built in the country since, I don't know, 1989. The National Commission on Human Rights, the autonomy of the National Electoral Institute, the autonomy of the Electoral Tribunal, uh, that attempt to concentrate power in two hands this attempt to destroy the institutional infrastructure. And in a couple of words, an attempt to destroy democracy. This is what determines that cleavage. And that's the reason why three parties that have different cleavages and they were confronting each other, now they are together. They do not want to destroy the political infrastructure. They don't want to concentrate power into hands. They don't want pluralism to be destroyed. Mexico is not divided uh, between liberals and conservatives. The least liberal thing we've had in this country is President Andres Manuel Lopez Obrador, who wants to destroy the division of powers, wants to destroy uh, lay uh, education. Lay. And it's not a matter of Morena being Christians or not. 80-something uh, percent of Mexicans are Catholics. All parties have a high percentage of Catholics. The issue is how do we bring this uh, Catholic faith into our lives. And I think uh, President Lopez Obrador have crossed those boundaries. And I think that's something that unifies or creates a, a line of fracture, a cleavage. And the that fracture is, well, do you want to continue with the policies of the current president or do you want to avoid the concentration of power? You want to maintain this division of powers? Do you want to maintain the institutional infrastructure represented by institutions like the Bank of Mexico, the National Electoral Institute, the National Commission on Human Rights, and many others? Or do you want power to be concentrated? I think this is the fracture line or the fault line that explains this, the Alianza for Mexico. Thank you much. Victor Ricardo, do you have anything to say? I, I I feel very pressed <laughs> with time. I really do not want to start a, a very profound debate right now. But um, I I think that the intention, the deliberate intention of the leader in Morena, it is a change of regime, political. Right? They, they, he calls it the fourth transformation. And this change of political regime, for him, it would come with its own constitution, its own division of power, its own budget, and its own institutions. I, I, I see this as very complicated. I doubt that he will be able to do it in the years he's left. If we see the results, uh, you know, what the polls are already saying, it's not even for sure that he will get a majority of the House of Representatives. There's nothing that, that says that he's going to change the accumulation of uh, power in the Senate. And I don't see that uh, voting is going to be larger than it was in 2018. Nothing that's going to change, you know, the governorships that much or the uh, municipalities. So I do not see the birth of a new regime or a new constitution. I think that that's uh, an electoral argument more than anything else. So looking at that reality, I will not tell you here. Uh, you know, I, I don't want to repeat what I what I hear from others from both sides, you know, both, um, you know, Morena saying that they're going to change the regime and the other side fighting or in opposition to that. So I don't see the conditions for that to happen. So having said that, what we see, what we observe, and there's evidence for that, is that 
there is a, a change in the in the party regime that is happening the party regime that we did not see this in 88 we saw it in 97 and that was um, it lived through 2015 we are observing a dramatic change and that's partially because morena has been incredibly um uh, capable of changing things. And they have, uh, you know, an electoral um, segment that is what, about 50 to 53%. But we have to be careful not to think that this has happened because of the president, because of Lopez Obrador. Perhaps that's the, the top, that's the ceiling. But we have to look at what's going on at the bottom. What's the basis for this? And what I do see is that every party, big and small, they're trapped in the sticky floor <laughs> that has left them incapable of analyzing why they lost power in 2018. So PAN started in 2018 way above uh, López Obrador. And it was, uh, you know, when the candidacy of Ricardo Anaya um, was dropped. That's what explains uh, the ascent of Lopez Obrador. And this is something that you do not review. Pan was ahead in 2018. What happened? If you start looking, it wasn't the anti party uh, discourse of Lopez Obrador. Things happened before that. According to Latino Barometro, 11% of the population at the time, uh, you know, had the positive percentage of the parties. The, the rest, rejected the parties. This is according to Latino Barometro, eight out of 10 people in the surveys in 2018, we said we wanted a radical change, not a slow change, not a slight change, but a radical change. And it was uh, affecting safety, security, inequity, and finally corruption. So what happened was uh, the Morena proposal uh, became the most credible one to respond to that radical change and to take distance uh, you know between themselves and the other parties that's what happened in 2018 that is according to our data so why haven't i seen the parties do a you know a history review why didn't review their past why do they come back this election as if that hadn't happened as if the rejection wasn't there as if what happened then doesn't really apply now and this lack of awareness of the opposition parties, I think that's partially the explanation for, what, for what's going on, not just Morena. In terms of the small parties, I would say those small parties are records. To me, they're going to be used. The candidates uh, in 24 are going to use them. Uh, this is what comes out of Morena by 24. It's not that Lopez Obrador is going to be out of the equation. I think Morena is going to be the, the shuttle board where you're going to be launching different candidacies. And those, uh, Forza por Mexico, MSA, uh, Green Party, all of those will be coming along. Uh, so IPAN, MPRI, and PRD, if they continue the way they are, they will be eliminated by 24. And the new party system will come from Morena. Morena does not have any life left after 2024, but it is a shuttle. It will launch new options. And those are the parties that are going to be important. It's, um, it may be early to start this conversation, but it's, it's worth looking at it in the circumstances. Very interesting, very interesting, Ricardo. It's a very interesting discussion, really. The, the future is the transformation to a different party system. And that's a very important hypothesis, very interesting, and something that um, we will be able to review uh, in the near future, I think, because I think uh, you are ready. And you're ready with a very important hypothesis here. Thank you. Uh, Victor, I think you had something that you wanted to say. I'm going to open up um, the discussion since we don't have a whole lot of time uh, so that you can um, you can tell us what you think regarding this question. Where are we going? Where are the political parties going? Whatever you want to say about where the parties are going. Where is Morena going? Where's the coalition going? Where are the small parties going? What is the response? to this hypothesis that Ricardo Rafael just expressed. Um,
You want to say something? Entonces, si quieres, René también quiere, este, quiere comentar algo, entonces podemos, podemos, este, primero René y luego tú para que, para que haya un poco de equilibrio también. Muchas gracias. Bueno, pues muchas gracias Guadalupe y gracias Víctor también. Eh, pero, a ver. En este eh, contexto electoral, yo diría algo, me gustaría señalar algo respecto de esta coalición Va por México. Yo creo que en realidad lo que está ocurriendo es que estos tres partidos, los que consolidaron un sistema de partidos, digamos, de mil, según se ve, a 1980, catastróficamente en el 2018 no hicieron un buen balance. Eh, ni siquiera se han detenido realmente a hacer ese balance o a hacer una reflexión de lo que ocurrió y por qué ocurrió lo que ocurrió. Eh, lo que creo que hay evidencia ¿no? de, para pensar que se intentan coaligar para sobrevivir. Yo no veo en ninguna de las plataformas de estos tres partidos, en sus discursos, en sus eh, análisis, en sus señalamientos, un verdadero proyecto de país o de nación lo cual tendría que construirse también a partir de un análisis propio, es decir, de lo que ellos hicieron a lo largo de los años, de los exenios que les tocó gobernar, en donde ciertamente fue catastrófico el resultado en términos generales, en términos de violencias, en términos de pobreza, de desigualdad, de injusticias, de grupos, amplísimos grupos de la sociedad que fueron desprotegidos por los gobiernos de corte neoliberal encabezados por el PRI y el PAN, y en donde en los últimos años el PRD se sumó, yo diría a partir del 2012 con el Pacto por México, y en donde empezó a eh, desfigurarse ideológicamente de manera mucho más clara, que también coincide con la salida desde luego de Andrés Manuel López Obrador del partido, del PRD. Entonces, este balance necesario de la oposición, de la hoy oposición, PRI, PAN y PRD fundamentalmente, es fundamental para poder competir en eh, condiciones, digamos, de eh, un posible éxito. Ellos dicen ¿no? y señalan que hay una reiteración del mensaje de parte de López Obrador, de su grupo, de descalificarlos, como si eh, la ciudadanía fuera ignorante, insensible, torpe, al momento de poder visualizar lo que ocurrió en México en los últimos exenios. Lo que ocurrió en México en los últimos exenios y a lo mejor estoy simplificando por la, el, la limitación del tiempo, pero fue, insisto, una serie de resultados adversos en términos institucionales, en términos políticos, en términos sociales, en términos de crecimiento, de mejora, de, de, de mejora para la, la, la vida de los amplios sectores sociales, ¿no? de protección de derechos eh, y de efectivamente un reconocimiento de la pluralidad, de la diversidad, y eso en el 2018 la ciudadanía lo dictaminó y decidió por una alternativa, que puede ser buena o mala, eso sería discusión de, eh, materia de discusión, de otra discusión, pero finalmente decidió la ciudadanía en el 2018 inclinarse por una alternativa, por una posición crítica, el obradorismo, frente a lo que venían haciendo los partidos eh, tradicionales, PRI, PAN y PRD. Y la decisión de la ciudadanía fue darle oportunidad de gobernar a esta nueva alternativa, Morena, que es una posición, yo diría, antineoliberal, no anticapitalista, pero antineoliberal, claramente, y en donde se están tomando una serie de decisiones y de acciones que, insisto, creo que todavía no se terminan de entender. Por una parte, porque el propio Morena no ha sabido quizá construir un discurso lo suficientemente eh, claro y explícito para hacernos entender lo que significa la 4T, y también porque hay una oposición poco, eh, yo diría, propositiva, poco analítica, muy enojada respecto de lo que están viendo, que no terminan de entender. Y frente a ese escenario, lo que puede ocurrir seguramente en esta coyuntura del 6 de junio es que las cosas se mantendrán más o menos iguales. Es decir, la, la percepción de la ciudadanía es 
que Morena está haciendo un esfuerzo, como decía Ricardo Rafael, por cambiar todo aquello que no funcionó adecuadamente en los últimos sexenios priistas y panistas y, eh, y ve también a una oposición debilitada, desestructurada, poco propositiva, ¿no? Y seguramente eso ayudará a mantener un escenario electoral más o menos como lo que estamos viendo. La segunda parte de este sexenio, yo me la imagino en términos de equilibrio de fuerzas en el Congreso y también un poco en cómo se están tomando las decisiones en el ámbito ejecutivo y de su contraste con, la, con el ejercicio de la oposición, más o menos igual a como lo he visto en esta primera parte del, eh, de este sexenio. No veo que vaya a cambiar eh, en realidad nada de manera radical. ¿no? Gracias, Guadalupe. Muchas gracias, René. Víctor, Dainzú, eh, si pueden ustedes hacer un comentario eh, final eh, por, por motivos de tiempo, como dijo Ricardo, sí, desafortunadamente tuvimos muy poco tiempo y hay tanto que decir sobre el futuro de los partidos políticos en México, analizándolos uno por uno y, y analizándolos por grupo fue lo que pudimos hacer. Pero bueno, esperemos que podamos seguir teniendo la oportunidad de seguir eh, comentando sobre este, sobre, sobre, sobre este tema que es tan importante. Víctor, dain su, sus comentarios, por favor. Eh, también, como Ricardo, me siento abrumado por la falta del tiempo. Bueno, trataré de hacer algunos comentarios. Yo sí estoy de acuerdo con un sistema de partidos del 97 al 18. Eh, está bien documentado, está bien analizado. En el 18 cambió, con la elección del 18 cambió. En teoría del sistema de partidos se propone que se esperen tres elecciones para ver si hay un sistema nuevo. Un, un, un nuevo sistema en una sola elección no nos permite concluir nada. Entonces la pregunta está abierta, creo que es una pregunta muy importante. ¿Qué tanto va a cambiar el sistema de partidos? La hipótesis de Ricardo me parece pertinente. No tenemos nada más que analizarla. Sobre el caso del PAN, sí ciertamente está en el artículo que presenté para este libro, para nuestro libro, el caso del PAN, las encuestas favorecían a Margarita Zavala sobre López Obrador en 2017. ¿Qué pasó? Primero que Ricardo Anaya se aborazó, cometió el error de preferir ser candidato él y no ceder el lugar a la candidata más fuerte de su partido. Ahí el PAN empezó a perder puntos en las preferencias. Fue un error interno de Ricardo, de, no, perdón, Ricardo Rafael, el otro Ricardo, Ricardo Anaya, discúlpame. <risa> Es el otro Ricardo. Y, y luego un dato que está ya muy comprobado, dato muy fuerte. Peña Nieto operó contra Ricardo Anaya, el principal adversario de Andrés Manuel López Obrador. Le echó encima todo el peso de la, de la Procuraduría Nacional de la República. Entonces, y eso ya está documentado, la misma Procuraduría dijo, usted disculpe, no nos equivocamos. Fue el otro factor. Ciertamente algo muy importante. Eso explica el triunfo de Andrés Manuel López Obrador. También se dice que los gobernadores priistas operaron a favor de Andrés Manuel. Hay datos sobre eso. Eso explica el abultado triunfo de López Obrador. No explica las preferencias actuales de Morena, que esas hay que explicarlas por otro, otras causas. Sí quiero comentar un análisis que, que presentó Leonardo Valdés en el mismo foro donde presentaste tu libro, Lupita, muy interesante, por cierto. Eh, de lo que presentaba Leonardo es, Morena ganó en 2018 100% la elección del presidente. Es una elección de un solo ganador, no hay problema. 43% de los morenos aliados eh, de las votaciones en el Congreso, en la Cámara de Diputados. En, di, en ayuntamientos, solo el 11% de los ayuntamientos en disputa los ganó. Y hay un poco la frase, contra el tsunami o contra el huracán, el dique municipal. Lo he comentado con amigos de Morena y me dijeron, sí, sí, pero es que no nos importaron los municipios. Nos importó nada más que ganara Andrés Manuel. Olvídate de los municipios. Algo dice sobre Morena en este tratar de armar el rompecabezas o el elefante completo. No nos preocupemos por los candidatos a los ayuntamientos. Queremos que gane Andrés Manuel. Sería eso. Y bueno, eh, último comentario. Carlos Ursúa calificó a Andrés Manuel de acuerdo a criterios neoliberales y creo que no sé si René tú dijiste, ha seguido o no sé, perdón, no recuerdo bien ha seguido el acuerdo del de, consenso de Washington. Carlos Ursúa decía por más rigurosos que nos ponemos con Andrés Manuel, por lo menos se saca un 8 dentro del credo neoliberal. 
Y la gran pregunta es, ¿qué está cambiando este gobierno? Este gobierno en concreto, ¿qué está transformando en los hechos? Apoderarse de la Comisión Nacional de Derechos Humanos, tratar de apoderarse del INE, del Banco de México. Ese es el proyecto de la Cuarta Transformación. En los hechos concretos, no en el discurso, ¿qué es lo que está haciendo este gobierno? Termino aquí. Hay muchas cosas, pero... Muchas gracias, este, Dentsu. Eh, tienes sí. Gracias. Bueno, pues sí, le, el tiempo, pero bueno, a mí dar un comentario final sobre la polarización, que sí me preocupa muchísimo, este, que veo que no, eh, no, no está mejorando esa situación y que no es privativo de México tampoco, eso es, en el mundo entero vemos este, que están muy profundas las, las diferencias y estas... Esta, esta, y bueno, el, eh, también creo que sería importante ver también la diferencia entre Morena en el tema, tema este de, de sistema de partidos, la diferencia entre Morena y, y, y López Obrador, ¿no? Una vez que ya no esté en la boleta, entonces el apunte de Ricardo Rafael me parece muy, muy interesante. Este, y, y bueno, todos parecemos coincidir en que los par tres partidos que forman la coalición pues no hicieron su tarea eh, y eso están pagando el precio ahora de, de no de ir pues de perder la representatividad de la, de la población de modernizarse de, 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 de responder digamos no a, a los retos como el cambio climático como eh, la violencia contra las mujeres o sea tantos temas que no ni siquiera están discutiéndolos ni entre ellos ni en las campañas porque ya también se ha dicho mucho en este en este encuentro pues que no se están más bien hablando de en contra estás a favor o en contra no de López Obrador y eso parece ser lo, lo que se basa la, la, la campaña en, en lo general y es pues muy lamentable perder este este momento para discutir los grandes este, los grandes problemas del país las áreas naturales protegidas el presupuesto a dónde se va a ir por qué se va a ir si yo propongo que se debe de ir hacia un lado o hacia el otro no este eh, y, y bueno pues este eh, pues esperemos ¿no? que, que la gente salga a votar el, el, el 6 de junio masivamente por la opción que, que mejor le parezca y, este, y bueno, pues, eh, eh, pues también no, no se habla mucho de los casicazgos, ¿no? también de cómo se están dirimiendo estos casicazgos o poderes locales este, y regionales en, 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 en dentro de los mismos partidos, no, no se habla mucho sobre, sobre eso, eh, y que, bueno, ahora están más que nunca, digamos, eh, 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 pues algunos eh, son poder legítimo, otros... Now are legitimate, legitimate power, other are just uh, in, in power. In fact, other are, they're supported by organized crime. So I think uh, the... It's uh, analysis is pretty complex. And, you know, with this hurricane of uh, Morena and Lopez Obrador in the political game. And there is a, a question that I would like to end with. is a question I've asked myself since Morena uh, won in a landslide. It seems that our country has in its DNA a, a just an hegemonic party. We want one party. So it, uh, took us a lot of effort to have this emerge and now we see a new party or movement uh, whatever we want to call it that's uh, hegemonic and and um, we will still see I mean one election does not provide that much evidence we see what happened with PRI who uh, alternated with PAN but I think it seems we like to have this steamroller type of party. Thank you very much. A pleasure to be here at this panel. Thank you very much. I would have really liked a lot to ask you a final question about your forecast for these elections. But now uh, Dr. Payan uh, just wrote to me that we need to uh, close this panel and the event. So uh, I'm very thankful for your comments. And again, uh, please read the book that the Colegio de Mexico uh, publishers will, will launch. And again, with the uh, Center Coalition for the US and Mexico, thank you to this panel. Thank you for 
uh, your participation and I yield the floor to Dr. Payan to close the event. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Correa. I think uh, that during this last four hours, uh, we have been debated a number of existential issues for Mexico. I think they are very important. And the uh, my uh, first comment, I think is part of this conclusion, is that a robust party system, political party system, where political parties are healthy and strong. It's, it's sine qua non, obviously, it's essential for our democracy. A regime with just one party is rarely a democratic regime. So the question that brought us together this morning at 8.30 was precisely what is the status of political parties in Mexico? And this panel obviously uh, presented some interesting questions about the uh, DNA of Morena, the capacity of parties to survive individually or collectively. And uh, on June the 6th, we will see the result of this. What's concerning, obviously, is that there are parties that accept the rules of the game and follow them and parties that don't. I think that we are at the crossroads in Mexico. We have a prevailing party, a hegemonic party at this time that does not accept the democratic rules of the game. And then there are parties that had established a number of democratic rules that allow this other party to obtain power, attain power with these democratic rules and that today is undermining those same rules. So I think that at the core of this is not only if we have solved the issue of security or lack of security, the economic issues are resolved or not, if the pandemic was uh, managed well or not, if uh, climate change is gonna affect Mexico. Of course, those are very basic and important questions, but we're talking about something even more basic, which is the type of regime that Mexicans are going to subscribe to. So I think that the lack of debate on substantial issues and programs on the part of political parties has a lot to do with the issue that we are having a debate that we had had in 1988, 30, 33 years later, we're again talking about what will be the rules and the participants and under which rules participants will uh, fight for power and will solve the problems of the country. The important thing is that uh, this was a debate that we thought had been resolved already, and it's not. It has emerged again, and obviously it's a big existential question for Mexico. I agree that local elections matter, and I also agree that the party is more divided than it seems. It's true that Morena uh, gets 40% of the vote, but there is uh, 50, 60% of the Mexican electorate that's elsewhere, they're distributed. But it's not uh, an issue of 80, 90%. It's a divided country. So what's important is to see which project of a nation will prevail. This fourth transformation, and we'll see what the, it is, or maybe a plural or pluralistic alternative. Uh, uh, with uh, a plurality of interests and parties in different visions of society and where we have ways and, and means to solve these conflicts. That's why I consider this election to be fundamental because there is something that's existential at the core of this election. And so this election, more than the number of positions that are being fought for. I think there's something that's more basic as the base at the base of this election. And Mexicans will have to ask themselves this question and go on vote. I think we've had an excellent discussions of where institutions are, where the polls are, where financing is, uh, what the electoral framework is in Mexico. We have an excellent had an excellent discussion on social cleavages, electoral practices, women, indigenous people, rural, urban, socioeconomic classes, the agreements uh, among parties with an ideological uh, landscape that's very inadequate 
to respond to to make those basic decisions now in Mexico. And it's an important discussion also on what Morena is and what the coalition is, if this coalition makes sense, where are we going and what will the result be? And finally, to conclude, I think that on June 6 in the evening, if everything works well, and uh, or maybe June the 7th in the morning, we will finally know what the result is, how divided Mexican society is, how consolidated Morena is and Lopez Obrador's project is, or if the opposition, as Soledad Luisa was saying, was arguing, is able by joining hands, by presenting an alternative option, if they can strengthen each other and achieve what they would not have achieved individually if they had workers independent parties, PAN, PRIER, PRD against Morena. So those questions are floating there. Uh, many questions have emerged. I think, uh, I hope this has been useful to the people who have listened to us uh, through the Baker Institute page, the Zoom page, and all of those who registered for this seminar. I would like to thank all the participants in, in the writing of this book. Uh, hopefully it'll be ready for the fall and it'll be in your hands. Uh, the title of this book will be for sure the status of political parties of, and the future of democracy in Mexico, which is I think at the core of what's uh, at stake in this election. We will continue working in this book. Thank you very much to all the authors, the writers, the participants. And on behalf of uh, Colmex, if my colleagues allow me, I want to thank everybody who participated and we will probably uh, have a post-electoral event to analyze the results. Thanks everybody and until next time.